forget that uh, the uh, next reflection essay is due tomorrow. Uh, in fact, uh, it's the last of the reflection essays. Uh, so uh, make sure to get that to an end uh, by tomorrow. And then that will just leave uh, a couple classes and the final exam. Um, there are still, of course, a, a couple of reading quizzes. Uh, make sure to uh, finish those up. Don't forget to, to keep up with them. And uh, so we're getting close to the end. And we're getting close to uh, the present uh, in the, uh, the 19th century. Uh, I know that, of course, is a couple hundred years ago, but we're getting closer to the present. We finished off on Tuesday uh, looking at uh, thinking about the ways in which 19th century Christians were attempting to understand their place in culture and society, um, focusing on uh, you know, talking about uh, the benevolent empire, this desire, particularly among evangelicals, to express their commitment to Christianity by changing the world, right? doing uh, things that would improve society, particularly in the United States and Britain. And so one of the things we uh, noted there was this kind of concerted effort, people working together across really denominational lines uh, to endeavor to make some changes, some reforms. On the other hand, uh, as we're uh, finishing up and beginning today, we were looking at some things that began to challenge uh, Christianity. And one of those is this idea of modernism. Um, the modernist outlook drew from changes in Western culture, some of which uh, were kind of mediated by Christianity, an increased interest in individualism, a further reliance on science and rationality when it came to truth, and as more and more people adopted a modernist outlook and as more people looked to science for um, explanations of reality, Christianity often found itself marginalized. And we finished up last uh, class by talking about the influence that Darwin particularly had in this. And that had a profound effect on Christianity specifically within uh, the United States as Christians began to ask the question of what do you do with Darwin's theory uh, about where human beings came from, how the world developed, how nature developed. For those that rejected Darwin, who looked upon Darwinian evolution and some other scientific developments, uh, we'll, we'll spend time in the 20th century talking about that because that is where a lot of that rejection of Darwin fully develops. But there were others who adopted a modernist out, outlook that sought to adjust Christian beliefs according to the times and the practices of modern understandings of reality. One of those expressions was liberal Protestantism. So these are Protestants particularly, who were persuaded by some of the scientific developments that questioned Christianity, who also were um, persuaded by other modernist philosophical positions, who though wanted to hold on to Christianity. For example, uh, Friedrich Schleiermacher, um, born in Prussia, wanted to hold on to Christianity, but he turned to, instead of doctrine, uh, instead of scripture, the ideas of feeling and experience as a way to hold on to Christianity. Instead of intellect and uh, a sense of literal understanding of the Bible. Son Marcus' father was a reformed pastor as well as chaplain of the army in Prussia. And Schleiermacher himself had been heavily influenced by pietism. Now again, we mentioned pietism briefly when talking about evangelicalism. And so pietism, this emphasis on the internal experience of Christianity, devotion to Christianity, led towards a rather uh, theologically conservative position uh, like evangelicalism, but in this case with Schleiermacher, uh, moving towards a theologically liberal position. 
And largely, it was Scott Marker's study of a variety of philosophers that led him to question some of the doctrines of Christianity, including the divinity of Christ. And so here we have, again, this question of the nature of Jesus. And if we accept him solely as a human being, what does that mean? Is it worthwhile talking about Christianity if Jesus is not divine? Well, Schleimacher and others thought that there were still some things to talk about with respect to Christianity. For Schleimacher, Christianity was grounded in feeling, not in morality or knowledge. And a lot of this is kind of a rejection that occurs in the 19th century of the Enlightenment emphasis on reason. People felt that Enlightenment had gone too far to emphasize the rational and rejected the emotional component of human life. And so Schleiermacher and others are trying to recover that. Doctrines, Schleiermacher believed, were second order expressions of the primary religious truth, the experience of redemption. And the most important thing in Christianity was that experience of rede redemption. Doctrines, uh, intellect, philosophy, that was secondary to this. So, essentially what he's providing for some people was a way to question the historicity of uh, various parts of biblical text or the history of Christian thought without abandoning, or at least in their minds, without abandoning being a Christian. Syrian Kierkegaard uh, represents another development in this modern approach to Protestantism. Kierkegaard's father was a businessman who retired uh, early to study theology. He too became interested in pietism. And Kierkegaard ended up having a rather rigorous upbringing religiously. In his early adulthood, he decides not to get married in order to focus on a religious life. Right. So he's going to not completely adopt monasticism, but he is going to abandon certain things of traditional society in order to focus on religious vocation. Particularly, he becomes convinced that God has called upon him to expose the paganness of the Christian society he was supposedly a part of. While Schleiermacher focused on feeling, experience, the scholastics focused on reason. For Kierkegaard, faith was the central part of Christianity. Reason cannot prove God's existence, but faith can. But faith is not simply this way to escape skepticism, but faith, for Kierkegaard, was costly. A premier example of this in his writings is Abraham's sacrifice of Isaac. This is the type of faith that Kierkegaard wanted to see not only in his own life, but in the lives of Christians. Human existence is full of anguish, doubt, and despair. And it's out of that focus on human existence that the term existentialism comes, which is usually the philosophical um, school associated with Kierkegaard. So it's full of anguish, doubt, and despair. This struggle for true Christianity, this struggle for human existence, this is a struggle, this is a struggle for true selfhood. There are three basic stages of existence for Kierkegaard, the aesthetic, the ethical, and the religious. In the aesthetic stage of life, we don't truly make decisions. We're unreflective. We absorb things in social life. We don't critically think about the world around us. The second stage is the stage of the ethical stage is one where we begin to recognize the need to free ourselves to true selfhood. That we've just kind of been floating through society. We allow things to just kind of happen to us instead of recognizing the existing. We need to, at this stage, recognize that we make deliberate decisions. But we still don't, said Kierkegaard, recognize the need to depend fully on God. Until we get to that third stage, the full recognition and experience of selfhood, the religious stage. Where we recognize there are often a variety of either-or propositions where faith would. For example, Jesus as God-man where we're faced with the, the proposition of either we believe that 
or we find ourselves offended at that. Theologians like uh, Schleimacher, Kierkegaard, and others provided the foundation for modernist Christianity, for liberal Protestantism, to come to terms with modern life and culture and Christianity. Essentially, liberal Protestantism, especially as it was expressed in the United States, tended to emphasize three concepts. First was that religious truths and religious ideas should be adapted to modern culture. So what becomes the, the criteria by which we hold certain doctrines and beliefs is our experience of modern culture, not the other way around. So, if we take, for example, the creation account from the book of Genesis, that doesn't become the criteria by which we think about the world around us. Instead, we modify how we think about the creation account in Genesis 1 as we come to understand modern culture. And so science, as it questions this, uh, even biblical studies, as it questions the creation account. For the liberal Protestants, we adapt how we understand those passages. Others, obviously conservative Protestants, would have rejected this and said, no, we need to adapt our modern culture, adapt our modern experience to what the Bible teaches. A second aspect of liberal Protestantism was that they tended to em emphasize that God was imminent in human culture. God was present, and as our cultures developed, we more fully experienced God. In contrast to, let's say, the thought of somebody like Jonathan Edwards or other Reformed theologians who would suggest, you know, God is totally separate. He is transcendent of human culture. He's separate. He's distinct. But with this idea of you adapt to modern culture, you find God imminently in the world around you instead of something separate, well, that means that as society develops, as society evolves, it is becoming closer and closer to the kingdom of God. So what we have here is a rather optimistic view of human nature and progress. Right, that we are moving in the right direction. We're moving, we're progressing, we're developing, we're evolving towards something positive. Well, as you might expect, the more you accepted these kind of ideas, the less you held on to certain doctrines. Original sin, for example. Right, now, I think there are other theological reasons to drop original sin, but for a lot of Protestants, you know, they believed in original sin, but once you start believing in these kind of things, you are less likely to believe that human beings start off as morally depraved, that human existence has nothing good in it without the miraculous imputation of the, the Holy Spirit. Other doctrines were reinterpreted. The divinity of Jesus, for example, was less about some sort of ontological existence as God, right? That, that Jesus was in being the same as God. Well, no, for liberal Protestants, Jesus being divine was more of a representative humanity that everyone should hope to demonstrate. And that's what it meant to be divine. So this shift from, you know, the foundation, the ground of Christian faith being not in Scripture, not in doctrine, but in human experience. Well, not everybody, of course, in the 19th century uh, adopted this kind of idea. Uh, we'll look at the conservative Protestants in, in 20th century, but some Catholics in the 19th century were skeptical of this optimism of modernism. Uh, Pope Pius IX, uh, the Pope who had, had the longest reign, was particularly opposed to modern ways of looking at life in Christianity. And so in 1864, he promulgated the papal document Quanta Curra, concerned with what he said, the evil opinions and the chief errors of this most unhappy age. Pius was particularly concerned about this naturalistic outlook that was developing, seeking to explain all of reality solely by naturalistic and scientific forces. 
But he was also concerned with the development of separation of church and state, thinking that both uh, were problematic. With Quantacura, uh, Pius also released um, syllabus of errors, which were which was a focused collection of a variety of errors that were being promoted in Western society. Things like the belief. Now remember, these are things that he says are errors. No, no, you don't need to, you're not going to need to know these. Uh, just to give you examples of some of the things he said. Uh, human reason as an error, without any reference whatsoever to God, is the sole arbiter of truth and falsehood, and of good and evil. It is law to itself, and suffices by its natural force to secure the welfare of men and of nations. That's an error, Pius is. It's being taught, it's being accepted. As human reason is placed on level with religion itself, so theolog the theological must be treated in the same manner as philosophical science. Another error. The church not only ought never to pass judgment on philosophy, but ought to tolerate the errors of philosophy, leaving it to correct itself. Right? So if there's a philosophical development occurring, uh, people were saying the church needs to stay out of it. Let the philosophical, uh, let the philosophers take care of it. Another error he was concerned about. Every man is free to embrace and profess that religion which, guided by the light of reason, he shall consider true. The ecclesiastical power ought not to exercise its authority without the permission and assent of the civil government. I mean, these are things, errors that were being taught, in, being taught in contemporary society. So he's focused on a variety of things. He's focused on this naturalistic outlook. Uh, he's focused on uh, things like socialism and communism, which were developing in the middle of the 19th century. Uh, he was concerned about civil society and its relationship to the church, Christian ethics. Things like marriage, modern liberalism, all of these things were relatively new developments that also concerned Pius. But not all popes were specifically focused on modernism infecting the church. A later pope, Leo XIII, was concerned about the influence of American culture on the Catholic Church in the United States. Now, as Catholics grew in number in the United States throughout the 19th century, they faced a lot of opposition. And often, many Protestants thought Catholicism and the American way of life were in opposition to each other. You couldn't be a good Catholic and be an American, a lot of Protestants thought. Now, a lot of that had been shaped by the Catholic-Protestant divide, uh, the focus of uh, you know, hierarchy and Catholicism. And so American Catholics have attempted throughout their history to try to accommodate their religious practice and thought to the American ways of freedom, liberty, and independence. Often, the American Catholic Church has evidenced an anti-traditionalism that European Catholics found disturbing. And so there were Catholics in the United States that supported, and still are obviously, supported the separation of church and state, supported democracy, all of those kinds of things. You said the Quantacora is uh, Catholicism? Yes. So these are all Catholicism right now. Sorry. That's right. While, while we're at Falls, what Pope what, what was it that did not the Quantacora? Uh, Pope Pius IX. Okay. Pope Leo XIII, however, was very concerned about Americanism. So he releases a document called Linguincae Oceani across the wide expanse of ocean. And in it, he expresses his distrust of the Americanism that was sneaking into Catholicism. And certainly within Catholicism itself in the United States, there were some Americanist priests and bishops that supported this, and there were others as well that tried to uh, rein it in. Here's just a, a brief selection of uh, Linguita Oceani. It would be very erroneous to draw the conclusion that in America is to be sought the type of the most desirable status of the church. 
or that it would be universally lawful or expedient for state and church to be, as in America, dissevered and divorced. The fact that Catholicity with you is in good condition, nay, is even enjoying prosperous growth, is, let's just say, by all means, instead of ball means, let's just say, by all means, uh, he was against the development of basketball, you know. Uh, the fact that Catholicism is prospering is by all means to be attributed to the fecundity with which God has endowed his church, right? There's something within the church that is going to grow. It's not the fact that it's growing because it's in the United States. And virtue of which, unless men or circumstances interfere, she spontaneously expands and propagates herself. But she would bring forth more abundant fruits if, in addition to liberty, she enjoyed the favor of the laws and the patronage of public authority. Right? The church is naturally going to expand. It's naturally going to grow. And so if you Catholics in the United States are looking at this as we're adapting to American ways of life, and that's why it's growing, maybe, but it might be even better if church and state weren't separated for the Catholic way of life. Right? So modernism, this secularism, the separation of church and state, some Catholics, including Pope Leo XIII, were very concerned that this was, uh, you know, was a step in the wrong direction. 